I don't know about you, but I find that last bit of Samborska's poem quite haunting. The idea, the image, that while some are cleaning up from the last war, tidying up from destruction and devastation, others grow tired of the tedium of the work. Over time, others arrive on the scene with less and less knowledge of what brought about the war in the first place and less interest to the point that ignorance becomes dangerously bliss. In the grass that has overgrown causes and effects, someone must be stretched out, blade of grass in his mouth, gazing up at the clouds. That image captures for me everything there is, I think, to say about Remembrance Day. That with the passing years, we are called to remember lest we forget. That we bear a solemn obligation to hold on to the stories, lest we live out their horrors again and again. Given how long we humans have studied war, it seems clear enough that the forgetting of the hard lessons learned is a perennial human struggle, but we forget at our own peril. It saddens me to say that I believe we are living in an increasingly dangerous and forgetful world. While the decades following the great wars of the 20th century saw a certain flourishing of peace and prosperity for many people on our planet, we are now witnessing the alarming rise of authoritarian governments and a renewed proliferation of nuclear weapons, just as the impact of climate change is causing severe disruption and dislocation of people around the globe. On top of these concerning conditions, under the monetized influence of social media, we are living more and more in polarized echo chambers where we typically only take in viewpoints that reflect and reinforce our own. And so it behooves us in our day to remember the past, to study the study of war, that we might ultimately study peace. I know that many of us, myself included, let out a great sigh of relief yesterday around lunchtime when the winner of the US election was announced. As cathartic as that was, and as hopeful as I am about our neighbor turning back from the brink, I'm mindful that the divisions between people remain in some ways as deeply entrenched as ever. And should we be seduced into thinking this reality is neatly contained on the other side of the border, we would do well to recognize the degree to which similar seeds of, dis of division and distrust have taken root in recent years in Canada and Ontario and in Toronto too. I know the outcomes of federal, provincial, and municipal elections in recent years have left many of us scratching our heads, wondering just who are these people that voted for so-and-so? It is a fair question to ask, especially if we can and will follow it up with genuine curiosity, with a willingness to seek to understand how it is that others can come to view have a hold view of the world that is so very different from our own. Now, I'll be the first to admit that this is really hard to do. And I'll be the first to remind you that it is a mandate at the center of our faith as Unitarian Universalists. Our affirmation of respect for the inherent worth and dignity of every person is meaningless if we are not committed to extending that respect even to those we struggle to understand. That is not to say we can't oppose with every fiber of our being, behavior or policies or attitudes we find objectionable, offensive, or dangerous. But when we harden our hearts against those whom we oppose, for whatever reason, we venture on to a slippery slope of dehumanizing of denying the humanity of the other. This is a point of critical caution that comes through the study of the study of war, that if we are to study peace, we must truly live into our first principle by recognizing the humanity of others, even if they have seemingly lost sight of it themselves. 
Now, it would be easy to imagine all of this as the exclusive domain of nation states or political parties duking it out for power. But the struggles of war and peace are rooted in the work of every human heart, in each of us as we navigate our daily lives. And so we must ask ourselves, do we truly remember? Do we honor the humanity of those in our lives who strain our patience, who test our commitment to our principles? Do we cultivate peace in our heart, even when it seems impossibly hard? Do we recognize that the choice between war and peace is put to us with each day in how we act and in how we react? Thirteen years ago, as Bob and I were packing up our lives in Boston to move to Toronto, I was amazed at just how much sorting and sifting and shedding was involved. One of the biggest chores for me involved paring down my personal library. Painful as it was, I parted with scores of books. I donated a few to the city library, some to the church I served, and the rest I deposited in the large metal book bin in the parking lot of our local supermarket. On the morning I was heaving boxes of books into the bin, I was suddenly startled by the telltale sounds of screeching tires and scrunching metal. Just a few meters away from where I stood, two SUVs had collided. Both drivers hopped out and instantly began yelling at each other. Fingers wagged and expletives filled the air. Spouses were called as well as the police. While quietly continuing to empty my books into the bin, I watched the scene unfold mostly because at that volume I couldn't help but be involved, but also in case I was called upon to testify in a court of law if things got out of hand, which certainly seemed possible. The crowning moment came when for insurance purposes, the two drivers got around to exchanging their contact and insurance information. Each driver in a whirl of fury demanded the other hand over her address. And then in an instant, everything changed. They exchanged their documents and to the horror of each, discovered that they not only lived on the very same street, but that they lived only a few doors apart. Their anger morphed into an awkward awareness as they slowly realized that they were neighbors. In that moment, they faced a choice over whether to behold the humanity of the other. Susan Griffin, the feminist philosopher and playwright says that the moment I have defined another human being as my enemy, I lose part of myself. I begin to exist in a closed system. When anything goes wrong, I blame my enemy. If I wake troubled, my enemy has led me to this feeling. If I cannot sleep, it is because of my enemy. Slowly, all the power in my life begins to be located outside. And my whole being is defined in relation to this outside force, which becomes daily more monstrous, more evil. The quality of my thought then is diminished. My imagination grows small. My self seems meager for my enemy has stolen all of these. If we are to truly study war no more, we must recognize that war can take many forms and that it comes in countless shapes and sizes. And we must remember that if we are to truly study peace, it begins by beholding everyone, even our enemies, face to face in the fullness of their humanity and of ours. Thank you, Sean. I remember when I started to study peace with more intention. I was in seminary, often sitting in the most serene of environments, light streaming in through beautiful windows, quiet nooks in libraries where I was reading books of ancient wisdom. 
At some point, it occurred to me that it's easy to contemplate peace and nonviolence when you're feeling peaceful, when you're not experiencing fear or any form of conflict. And out of that came a song. Happiness looks easy when you're happy, when everything seems effortless and free. Every way you look at life, you're laughing when life's the way that you like life to be. Happiness looks easy when you're happy, satisfied with everything you've got. Happiness looks easy when you're happy. It's anything but easy when you're not. And the song goes on to include the line, Peace is effortless unless you're angry. I don't know about you, but that is certainly true for me. Even though I have become a minister, and in some ways, peacemaking has become my life's work. As the Buddhist teacher Jack Kornfield wrote, we must look at ourselves over and over again in order to learn to love to discover what has kept our hearts closed and what it means to allow our hearts to open. Spiritual growth is not about ridding ourselves of difficult emotions, but rather learning how to handle them more skillfully. It is, needless to say, lifelong work. Carl Jung also said something helpful when he said, enlightenment is not about imagining figures of light but in making the darkness conscious. In any life, we find ourselves in situations that bring us into conflict with others, everything from mild differences of opinion to violent conflict. With intention, understanding, and practice, we can learn to become more skillful during these times, understanding our own responses and becoming more respectful and compassionate with those with whom we disagree. This is, of course, a huge subject, and there are many people who are much better at conflict resolution than I. But in the few minutes we have, I'd like to share a few insights that have been helpful for me. I frame them under the general heading, getting over myself. Looking through the lens of spiritual growth, I find several meanings in that very familiar phrase. In order to grow or to gain in wisdom, I must let go of my previous less mature self. And I need to get over my own perspective, my own self-interest, even momentarily, to begin to understand a point of view that is very different than mine. So here are a few things I found useful. The first getting over myself has to do with tapping into something larger, zooming out, if you will, to glimpse my place in the cosmic scheme of things, to gain a bit of humility and to open my mind. At the Awakenings drop-in group last Tuesday, we looked at the Unitarian fourth principle, the free and responsible search for truth and meaning. And we read a poem by Janet Hutchinson called, Of Course. Look how big the sky is, the deep distances between stars. Little speck, that's you. Laughable speck, that's me. How could we contain the truth, all that overwhelming light? Our truth is just a pinprick in mystery's velvet curtain even so, see how we struggle to fix an eyeball to that peep show's tiny window. I think, too, of the well-known Gallic blessing found in our hymn book. Deep peace of the shining stars to you. Deep peace of the running wave to you. When I'm experiencing conflict, either within myself or with another person, it helps to reach toward that deep peace, to sink down into silence, even briefly, to consider the billions and billions of stars in the universe, 
to lose myself in, the, in music, in poetry, or to simply breathe in the peace of nature. These are all ways of finding freedom from the cage of my own small self, my own judging self, which can be very easily threatened and can behave in ways that do not maintain peace. Something else that I found helpful is to study the way I respond and other ways and, and ways other people respond when asked to change our behavior in ways that we find uncomfortable, in ways that may spark fear or anxiety for us. Recently in doing some work for pastoral care, I came across a helpful, a helpful list of four ways that people sometimes respond when asked to change in ways that they don't want to. The first is comply. Simply do the thing being asked, perhaps to avoid conflict. The second is attack. I think we all know what that means. And of course, it can happen, it can be done in so many ways. The third is rebel. Deliberately do the thing we were asked not to do, perhaps in a big or dramatic way. And the last is cut off, walk away, escape. Stop talking. Shut down. Now these are very short descriptions, and again, we have limited time. But on this Remembrance Day Sunday, perhaps they can be helpful as we look back on conflicts that we have experienced in our lives. Have there been patterns in the ways that we respond? Have we tended to comply, attack, rebel, or cut off? or some combination of these. Once we bring our behaviors into the light of awareness, as Jung rec recommends, can we then choose a different response in the service of peacemaking? Can we turn to the deep peace in order to do this, knowing that it takes courage and strength to do so? Can we get over our habitual ways of responding even briefly? And can we see that others may be responding in these habitual ways too, out of fear and anxiety, so that we may meet these people with more compassion and meet ourselves with more compassion, I would add. I can say for myself that this is definitely a work in progress. Peace is effortless unless you're angry and insight's simple, <laughs> don't you understand? Well, it's not simple, and it takes time. The uncomfortable truth is that life, this interdependent web of existence we share, contains many apparently opposing elements. Being able to hold them all with some degree of equanimity and peace is not something humans find easy. Indeed, significant growth, or indeed evolution, may be necessary for us to gain the skills we need to maintain peace in this world. This is the profound getting over ourselves, which is the process of transformation. We've been talking about transformation for many weeks now, cocooning in our homes and experiencing profound changes in ourselves, many of, many of which will take years to come to light, to fully understand. In the meantime, we'll find ourselves encountering challenges and differences that call us toward that change. And it may be uncomfortable. In fact, I think it is guaranteed to be. And yet, we can have faith that the creative work underway in this world is underway in us at all times. We are fully alive and growing, intertwined within this magnificent evolving life we all share. May we have the courage to grow, getting over the parts of ourselves that need to be let go to make more room for compassion, for love, and for peace. May it be so.